So good morning, everybody. Welcome uh, to the PCB management block. My name is Dirk Jan Hogendoorn. This is Ed Verhammer, my co-chair. Presentation is about feasibility of local treatment, uh, Stockholm Convention deadline, and also transport obstacles. Um, there are some things I will talk briefly about the philosophy, uh, the summary we did on the 12th forum, uh, PCB's uh, workshop. And then we go into the other details. Okay, so we want to transfer now our local expertise to uh, other countries, to local partners, so they can manage their own uh, PCB uh, waste issues and demands. Um, and also the, then a lot of uh, revenue stays in the country itself. So it's not like the money is going to flow back to the West where also the PCBs uh, came from. Uh, but also uh, it stays there. And what we found at the 12th uh, HCH forum in the PCB workshop was that uh, by using existing local capacity for licensed high temperature treatment of liquid PCBs and POPs, we can treat 80 to 95% of the PCBs uh, locally in many countries. And this obviously involves uh, using uh, the capacities of the cement industry to uh, uh, co-process uh, the POPs and the PCB uh, liquids. And hopefully they can also upgrade to treating the solids. That will be up to Ed and uh, Egermond. But then we would only have to export 5% overseas. So at least from an environmental point of view, that would be a, a huge improvement and uh, a huge reduction in uh, risk uh, with the transport. Now, why do we want to do life cycle management uh, instead of only doing inventories for PCBs and uh, taking out the PCB equipment? Mostly uh, because also uh, PCB free transformers uh, may benefit from this approach. If we do sampling, uh, we look not only for PCB content, but also for some other key uh, parameters. We can tell a lot about uh, the electrical condition of a transformer and also about uh, remaining lifetime, uh, uh, remaining thermal lifetime to be more specific. We can tell you if it's wet or if it's dry, if it needs maintenance. So if you go along the, the, the power grid in an emerging economy uh, country, and you only look for PCBs instead of doing a full uh, survey, which uh, actually is a very low additional cost, you miss the opportunity to make a complete map of the uh, reliability and uh, the issues in the power grid. So we could increase the stability and the reliability because we know then exactly where the weak points are in the grid and in the transformers. And the low PCB contaminated transformers, Frank will also show a big uh, diagram uh, to, uh, what kind of decisions to make. They can be cured. They can be treated during normal, regular maintenance with some equipments that are available. We can uh, dry the transformer. We can uh, take out uh, a lot of uh, uh, particles from the oil. And at the same time, it's also possible to remove low, con low concentrations of PCBs. So that's a good uh, a reuse uh, possibility. Now we see a lot of demonstration projects uh, where we try to do 100% local treatment of PCB waste. That's not always an economic and environmentally sound solution. I have some uh, appendixes in my presentation where I work out a model. Uh, but basically, uh, what, what I found, for example, in Morocco with uh, uh, the treatment company there, is that they do a demonstration project and then four or five years they have nothing to do. They rent a uh, space, they put the equipment in there for doing PCB waste treatment and then four years they don't have any business after the demonstration project ends because everybody's waiting for the next uh, subsidized round. 
So that's not a real viable business model, especially not if we make uh, a lot of uh, full treatment uh, uh, efforts. So by reducing that to only treating the liquids, for example, there would not be such an extensive installation required, not such a big capital expenditure. And it would be much more flexible uh, and geared to the need of demonstration projects until a real full-scale project is there where we can guarantee uh, the required amount to make it feasible. Okay, now the deadline. So we uh, must, uh, I don't think this pointer is actually doing it. <laughs> we must uh, eliminate the use of the PCB equipment in three years time now, 2025. And 2028, that's five years time, it should all be disposed of uh, in an environmentally sound way. Well, I, uh, we guesstimate that uh, 50 to 80% is still waiting for treatment in uh, lots of areas in the world. Even if we see today well, what we get from the Netherlands and France, uh, there's still a serious amount uh, in Western Europe available for treatment. Um, <clears throat> okay. So the question is, uh, what do you think? What, what, what would you say uh, in your country is still uh, there? Is there anybody who can say something uh, intelligent about that? About uh, how much waste is not disposed yet? How much waste is in storage or in? <laughs> uh, the thing, electric systems are for using from China, most of it. Yes. It's coming to us. And so I believe that we, are, we have them everywhere in water and land. And so need management. Okay. Anybody else who wants to say something? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, the, the amount of uh, transformers in use, uh, typically we found 25% in the population is uh, contaminated. So a lot of countries where they are still struggling with uh, supplying electricity and upgrading the grids may not have even taken them out of service yet. And the question that I would like to end with is what can we do to achieve the PCB waste disposal deadline? And then Frank will also do a lot of uh, uh, things about the logistics in this presentation, so I don't have to cover that. So we heard from Polieco yesterday, for example, that they... Uh, <clears throat> ah, that's about logistics. <laughs> So do we uh, have to gear up the local uh, uh, treatment capacity used for that? More local treatment? Anybody? Juan? <laughs> Good. Uh, maybe uh, we have to extend the deadline. Anybody for extending the deadline? Is that the viable solution? Two people? Three? I think that would be happening as well. Or should we make a uh, big uh, treatment in the, in the EU and in, uh, well, basically the Euro European Union is the only, you say it's expensive. Please, uh, can, uh, can you give uh, the microphone over there? Okay. Good morning. Yes, it's quite expensive, and the question: Who will pay for that? Because in you know in Europe we have a different situation rather than in countries with economy in developing. So it's it's a compli complicated, for instance, for for those small countries, which should invest the money in some other priorities rather than in solving <coughs> the or disposing the PCBs. My opinion is that 
sooner or later that term 2028 is going to be extended, that's for sure. On in my personal uh, own. Can you turn up the volume a little bit, guys? The volume a bit higher? Can you say something? See if it... Uh, now it's okay? Yeah, better. Yeah, thank you. So I, I was saying that um, the target 2028 definitely is going to be extended because the countries will not manage by that time, which is five years from now, to solve the entire uh, problems generated by the PCB, especially in closed systems. But we have another uh, biggest chunk of the PCBs which are in open systems, sealants and all of that stuff, which should be addressed as well. We have countries who, which even uh, have not started the PCBs inventory of well of that kind of waste. So, in my opinion, 2028 is going to be extended. Right. Okay, we will take uh, two more, maximum. Um, a little bit of a perspective from, from the developing world in, in Southern Africa. The local capacity is there, but to qualify the local capacity is very expensive. And companies won't go to that effort unless there is support. Um, so, talking out of personal experience, probably 15 years ago, uh, the company I worked with went 85% of the way to qualify a cement kiln to, to co-process PCBs with all the testing and everything. And we stopped at the last hurdle because of the lack of support from our own government, but also international development organizations that made the business, the whole business concept just unfeasible. So the perspective from the developing world is talk is very nice until the money has to flow. Then people rather prefer the solutions in Europe for some other reason. Ah, it's crazy. Okay, one more. <clears throat> uh, I have been raising my hand for the local solutions for following reasons. Okay. In Europe, we have an integrated waste market. It's not every country standalone, but we sh every country is part of the solution and we move waste between the countries. So you incinerate in Switzerland, the filter ash goes to Germany for final uh, repository, for example. As soon as you get outside of the developed world, there is nothing there. But these countries are developing, they're uh, having industry, they're producing, and they sit on the uh, mountains of wastes. And I think we should not look at waste sectorally. Here is my PCB, there is the POPs, here is the uh, mining waste, uh, here is the galvanic industry waste. I think we can only get the economic uh, system working if we look at the grander picture. If we, need, if we want to have a high temperature incinerator, the market must provide 40 to 100,000 tons of wastes a year. And that would obviously absorb automatically your PCB. But that right. only works if a government says there is a guaranteed stable market, there is a price with it. If you invest 200 million or 100 million today, you will recoup it in five to 10 years and then you can make profit. And I think that's also what Egmont already alluded. This is the missing thing, the, the grander strategy, the grander vision outside of our PCB or POPs box or uh, whatever other box and uh, a government taking the lead and saying, what do we need to have hazardous waste industry working in our country or in connection with the neighboring countries? Thank you. Yeah, so the holistic approach again, same like we do with the life cycle management, we should also do with the waste management, waste cycle management. Okay, thank you. Uh, next presentation, I think. Good morning and uh... Thank you very much that we do have this opportunity to give with my colleagues Valentin Pleshka and Larissa Kupcha to present the Moldovan experience in terms of PCBs management. So actually this year somehow we do celebrate the POPs agenda in Moldova 20 years, you know, from the moment when Moldovan government started to implement the Stockholm Convention provisions. 
So today we will try to summarize in those 13 minutes, you know, the entire achievements and challenges which have been faced by the Moldovan uh, government, I would say, and all stakeholders involved in the PCB's management since 2002. So Moldova being a small agriculture country with uh, less heavy industry have never, has never produced PCBs and neither PCB containing uh, equipment. So in, uh, in past Moldova was used as a hub for transmitting the electricity from Russia to, from Russia to Balkans. And for that, we, uh, it was necessary uh, huge numbers of capacitors to compensate the losses in the network. So uh, more than 20,000 of uh, capacitors uh, were used at that time in Moldova just to compensate the losses in the network. Uh, most, of the most of the PCBs were um, located in the uh, uh, power installation equipment, uh, both uh, in transformers and in capacitors, I mean closed systems. Uh, 23,000 of uh, power transformers, switches, inductors in use containing about 23,000 tons of uh, the electrical uh, oil have been identified uh, in 2000, just before uh, the Moldovan government uh, you know, uh, signed the uh, Stockholm Convention and afterwards uh, ratified. Of course, to address this uh, uh, problem, that problem actually the uh, you know, the first steps were necessary to be undertaken and the, prime, the initial uh, activities which were included on the uh, government agenda was to have the reliable uh, PCB inventory. Starting from that time, uh, Moldova uh, developed national implementation plan for the Stockholm Convention, uh, both uh, trying to obtain uh, support from the national state budget, including from the international uh, donors. And the, uh, in terms of PCBs, uh, the national implementation plan at that time has addressed four main uh, activities. The first one uh, it was related to strengthening uh, the regulatory framework. The second one was uh, focused on uh, having full-scale national inventor of PCBs in the closed systems. The third activity, activities, uh, uh, activity included in the uh, NIP was disposal of electrical uh, equipment, mainly capacitors used in the uh, transportation uh, system. And the last activities which were included at that time in national implementation plan uh, related to PCBs was remediation of PCBs polluted areas. Uh, all, all of those activities have been uh, implemented starting from 2006 to 2010 when the um, uh, Minister of Environment at that time has developed a project and applied uh, through the World Bank to the GF and Moldova uh, at that time obtained around 6.5 million uh, uh, financing from the GF and uh, half uh, additional 50% have been allocated by the National Ecological Fund uh, plus national contribution as well as in kind uh, contribution and other international donors. Starting to the first activity which was included in the National Implementation Plan, uh, Moldova has uh, developed its own regulation on PCBs, which was approved uh, in February 2009. And the, you know, the items which have been you know, included and afterwards followed uh, in the in management, in the process of management of PCB, starting with, with the activities like identification of the stakeholders. Afterwards, uh, regulation describes how the inventory should be done. The labeling system is also uh, included in the PCB regulation. Uh, afterwards, provision for storaging the contamination and disposal of the equipment uh, contaminated with PCBs. Uh, analysis of PCBs, uh, permitting requirements, uh, including how to apply and the condition for obtaining the permit, uh, administration provision, and of course, penalties. 
On the secondary uh, stage, having already the PCB regulation uh, developed and approved, the Minister of Environment together with the stakeholders involved in the process has developed the um, guidelines or separate handbook uh, who was meant to be used by the technicians, especially in the um, uh, electricity sector. And that handbook was describing actually each activity starting from the identification up to uh, final disposal. So that document was um, developed together with uh, uh, Urs Wagner, who has uh, at that time uh, assisted the Moldovan government to increase and also to explain the risks of PCBs and uh, how the problems should be solved and firstly how should be addressed and afterwards how, how the problems should be solved. Uh, back to 2008, just before the regulation has, be up, has been approved, Moldova has started to prepare the full-scale inventory of uh, uh, electrical equipment, mainly um, transformers and capacitors covering, as I said, the entire, the entire country. And the target was uh, to identify the electrical equipment which is uh, uh, supposed to be uh, contaminated with PCB. So meaning that the, um, all, uh, all pieces of electrical equipment with volume uh, more than five liters were subject to the PCB inventory. And the limit of the uh, PCBs uh, w according to the national regulation is 50 ppm. That was necessary to be addressed because afterwards uh, we may end up with uh, such story when the cross-contamination uh, is happening, you know. People simply don't care what is doing with the oil, uh, you know, used from one piece of electrical equipment to another one. So the objectives of the inventory was to identify the holders. It was, you know, um, uh, the sampling uh, and the, the laboratory analysis have been organized in a such manner to cover the entire country. So we have had for this uh, organized uh, three mobile units, which were composed from two person, one, persons, one from, uh, from the ministry side who have been trained to fill the inventory form and to uh, follow the sampling procedure. And the, the second person was uh, an, a representative from the uh, company side, uh, being as a technician one, being responsible to open the tap and to disconnect the uh, equipment in case it was necessary. The entire process has been tested and afterwards replicated at the national uh, level. Uh, also in the uh, sampling, I mean in the inventory process starting uh, with the sampling, we have discussed and we have informed all holders of electrical equipment about the impact of the PCBs and why uh, such kind of activities uh, were necessary to be undertaken. And at the end one, at the end the activities included in the PCB inventory was to have a reliable uh, database with all um, owners and the equipment at the national level. So at that time, we have covered the um, uh, generation sector. Uh, in that and at that time, we have had three companies involved. Uh, one company at the national level, which is responsible for the transportation of the energy. Four distribution companies uh, at the national level, uh, one being a private one, which is owned by a, a company from Spain. And additionally, uh, around uh, 7,800 of big and small consumers have been uh, ad included as um, in the list of stakeholders uh, to be uh, being which were included who have been included in the project. So here we have the map, I would say, with our results at that time. And in the first presentation, you we've been asked if we know how many uh, or the number of equipment uh, which is still available or still um, uh, in, uh, in functioning in, in the countries. So here we have the figures. So altogether we have sampled, I mean identified, sampled and labeled 2,770 of uh, uh, units 
which have been South touched, uh, labeled, and included in the database. From those 25,000, uh, around 1,800 of samples have been uh, identified with chlorine positive uh, using uh, uh, the L2000DX uh, equipment, which is provided by Dexil, including their reagents. And afterwards, those false positive samples have been analyzed for identification of the content of PCBs using the GCS, GCMS method. So at the end, we got that from 25,000 of uh, units, 546 uh, electrical, uh, I would say, equipment has been identified contaminated with PCB and concentration was more than 50 ppm. So altogether in Moldova right now, we have 176 tons of uh, the electrical oil which is uh, contaminated with PCB. Uh, and in terms of units, uh, uh, 540, uh, 400, uh, 546 uh, units. That was related to the um, uh, equipment owned by the companies, mainly transformers, switches, and other, ty and other type of electrical equipment which contain oil in a volume more than uh, five liters. The second chapter of the, uh, of the PCBs uh, uh, issue in Moldova was capacitors. And on the right uh, side of the Nisro River, which is uh, controlled by the Moldova government, we have, have, we have had uh, identified more than 18,000 of electrical capacitors in 13 uh, stations of Mold Electrica. So altogether, the entire amount of the PCBs uh, from, from those PCBs capacitors were more than 900 tons of waste which has been dismantled, uh, repacked and shipped uh, being afterwards disposed in France in the period of 2006-2007. It, it was a quite long and complicated process. We have had to wait more than six months to get the permit for transbordary movement, especially from Hungary, because at that time it was quite difficult to do. There were too many projects uh, implemented and the Hungary government was quite, uh, you know, precaution in providing the acceptance for transborder movement. But, you know, again, that was the biggest challenge uh, when the project has been implemented. Even, even more. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Even more, we have had a big delegation uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Hungary just to, to explain and also to confirm the intention of Moldovan government. Immediately after the entire amount of PCBs capacitors um, were uh, dismantled and uh, uh, shipped to France for disposal, we have started the second action in the field of uh, PCBs. So is, it, was dealing, it was related to the excavation of the uh, PCBs trans capacitors, which were buried back in 1970s, where two fire incidents were happened at the biggest um, uh, electricity substation, which is in south of Moldova. So we have had uh, identified all uh, contaminated area where the PCBs capacitors were buried at that time. Immediately after we have undertaken one feasibility study in 2007 to identify the exact, the exact size of the problem. So at the end, uh, again, having the support from international uh, communities, we have succeeded to uh, clean up that territory. Unfortunately, the soil which was uh, contaminated with PCB were not, was not disposed uh, outside, I mean through incineration, but it has been stored in a coffer dump just to, for, for later actions uh, which are uh, less expensive than incineration, just for, for later. So here we have some pictures from the actions which were uh, uh, undertaken at that time when the soil has been excavated and removed to the coffer dam, the concrete, uh, uh, concrete stuff has been also removed and afterwards at the end the entire area has been uh, planted with the trees and monitored by the environmental authorities. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. After the two previous presentations, I think that the topic that is being carried out, it is even more interesting. We all know that there are many sites contaminated in inventories. We can see that there are over 2.5 million of potentially polluted sites in the EU. This is mainly due to anthropogenic activities. In the case of PCB, we can see it. it is difficult to remediate it. And we can see that the management of these waste, either condensators or transformers, this generates a big problem. And sometimes its presence in soils, this leads to contamination in certain sites. We can also see the presence of PCBs as well as heavy metals. This way, when there is a coexistence of both wastes in the soil, it is even more complicated to solve it. There would be a higher risk for soil functions to recover the waste elimination. And of course, this poses a big risk for human health. So if possible, if possible, when there is a soil contaminated, if possible, we would need to put into place a sustainable soil remediation strategy. That is something that we can use on site. And this way we can make the most of soils. We can harness them. This is not always possible, of course. When it comes to nanotechnology, we have different techniques that are being applied in different fields. For example, for medicine, cosmetics, biotechnology, and over the last years, this has also been applied to the environment. We have different articles and we have seen promising results. And also we are working with these results in our group. By using iron nanoparticles, we can remediate the soil polluted land and also with some organic components. The nanoscale zero valent iron particles, those of course, are nanoparticles, highly reactive, and they have a core with zero. And in the cortex, we have different um, iron reactions. These nanoparticles in contact with the contaminants can lead to absorption or reduction. In the case of zero iron nanoparticles, this can also be used with palladium. According to the articles being published and the tests, this will lead to a higher reactivity. So the question that we posed ourselves was, can we use these nanoparticles that are given good results with heavy metals in order to decontaminate this soil, which has a mixture of pollutants with PCB and chromium, so this was the objective of this work, to evaluate the effectiveness of different types of iron nanoparticles for the remediation of an industrial soil contaminated with CR and PCBs. For this, we used nanoscale zero valent iron, the same, but also with PD as catalyzer and nanomagnetite. In this slide, we can see the soil characteristics that we used. This is an industrial land contaminated in the north of Spain, in Asturias. This is a historical contamination. And the levels of chromium were exceeding the threshold levels from Asturias, which is the region where this soil is. When it comes to PCVs, the total value also exceeds the royal decree from the Spanish legislation. Here we can see the characterization of iron nanoparticles with different techniques in order to prove their reactivity, stabilization, and size. As we can see here, the zero nanoparticles, both alone or together with PD there, and with a nanomagnetite, this was used in a solid medium. The test that was carried out was on the lab, and we tried the three nanoparticle types in pseudo aerobic conditions. This was due to avoid the rapid absorption of the iron nanoparticles. Once we had the controlled conditions of temperature, we did different samplings for 15, 45, and 70 days. 
during these samplings, we analyzed the soil aqueous extract, we measured the chromium and PCBs, and also the remaining soil in order to analyze the concentration of chromium, concentration of palladium, because some of them contained palladium, and also the concentration of remaining PCBs. So now, we will explain the results. As you can see in this picture, the treatment with the free nanoparticles had a significant reduction of chrome in the extracts at the three sampling times. There was no differences among sampling times or treatments. So as we can see, this is a very fast reaction. And after 15 days, there was no concentration in the aqueous fraction. In the case of PCBs, we could not detect this component in the soluble treatment due to the hydrophobicity and the limited PCB leaching. We also conducted a test about CR availability in soil. We used the TCLP, which has to do with lixiviation. And what we can say here is that the three nanoparticles significantly reduced the chromium availability in soils at the three sampling times, and this was stable for at least 70 days. This was also fast because after 15 days, the concentration had been reduced and it was stable. If we analyze the remaining chromium in soil, we can see that the treatments with nino valent, both with palladium and without palladium, had the best results in comparison with the nanomagnetite. There were similar concentrations with chromium, and the mechanisms that can be used are reduction, because we are talking about chromium, so chromium-6 is reduced to chromium-3, and we can also have an absorption of chromium-3 or 6 on the surface. Since we had palladium in the zero iron particles, we had to analyze whether this palladium would be incorporated into the soil or not. According to the legislation, palladium is not there, but this is being used. So we wanted to know whether this was integrated or not. As you can see, the availability with the same test with the TCLP, after 15 days, we can see the concentration of palladium, but this gets reduced after 70 days and the concentrations would be 1% of the uh, solution applied. So yes, it is a low concentration, but we should take this into account when applying these kind of nanoparticles. And now we will talk about the PCBs. We analyzed different PCBs, and there are several graphs, but in the different colors, we can see that both um, iron zero particles with palladium and without palladium had the best results over time for most of the tests. Of course, we can see that in some of them, there was a greater efficiency. And something quite surprising is that if we take a look at the red columns, this is nanomagnetite. So we can see that in the beginning, the concentration of PCBs is reduced when we apply the magnetite, but then this increases. So this is a reversible process. According to some studies, nanomagnetite is used as something to extract the organic components. So in this case, it retains, but then it, it absorbs later on. So this wouldn't be an appropriate mechanism. In the case of iron nanoparticles, both with palladium or without palladium, here the efficiency is much higher. With palladium, we have to say that this is faster. After 15 days, we can see better results with palladium, but after 45 days or 70 days, the efficiency is just the same. Another interesting thing is that the blue columns, the control columns, didn't have any kind of treatment with nanoparticles, but this also diminishes over time. This is due, of course, to biodegradation because we are talking about humid soils and the microorganisms with pseudo anaerobic conditions, they are able to degrade the PCB. So there is a degradation. And over 45 and 70 days, in most of the cases, the concentration is the same as with the treatment with nanoparticles. So if there was only PCBs in the soil, then bioremediation would be the appropriate technique. It is also true that the performance is not very high. Why this happens? Because this is a historical contamination. So what we are treating 
with bioremediation with microorganisms or nanoparticles is the availability of available PCBs. It is accessible for microorganisms and nanoparticles can have the capacity to react. And the rest of PCBs would be too absorbed and therefore it is difficult to carry out a proper treatment. In general terms, as conclusions, this is a summary of what I explained. The addition of the three types of nanoparticles does lead to a reduction of litability in soil, and it leads to immobilization for at least 70 days. So this would be ideal for chromium. Both the NSAID VI and with palladium showed higher effectiveness for the reduction compared to nanomagnetite. After 15 days, the PCB's concentration significantly decreased in soils, but in the case of nanoparticle, there is a reversible process, and this wouldn't be adequate for the treatment. And finally, the use of nanoparticles with PD implies the incorporation of palladium into the soil. So we need to observe whether this concentration is okay or not. The bioremediation process will be useful for the soil. We can obtain the same results with nanoparticles, but the problem is that the bioremediation process won't be able to reduce the chromium, and therefore the chromium concentration would be still there in the soil. And this is the problem with a soil mixed with different contaminants, because it is more difficult to look for an a proper treatment. But we can see that the addition of nanoparticles, both with palladium or without palladium, under pseudo-anaerobic conditions, could be used as a good alternative for the remediation of soils co-contaminated with chromium and PCBs. And that's all. Thank you very much. So, good morning. Everybody, uh, my name is Roland Weber from Germany, working since nearly 30 years on POPs, and since uh, 15 years I mainly work for Stockholm Convention. The talk of today is monitoring of PCB in X as sensitive indicator for contaminated sites from PCB management, highlighting the need for stricter control of PCB waste. I would like to uh, inform, we had published in 2018 um, review paper on the life cycle of PCB and contamination. So what we find from production over the use of PCB, we have contaminated sites, but then also the end of life mean around uh, shredder plants, PCB disposal sites, metal plants, uh, but also the use of PCB in open application. And finally, over the last 70 or 80 years use of PCB, uh, much PCB have ended in soil. So soil is a kind of memory of the environment and is further uh, source uh, for exposure. So, and I, for today, I will show you that exposure for chicken eggs because they are one of the most sensitive ones. Free range eggs are sensitive indicators for PCBs, but also for dioxin contamination in soils and eggs and meat are important exposure pathways from uh, polluted soils to humans. So therefore here, chickens and eggs are actually perfect active samplers for these uh, pollutants, and you can screen for contaminated uh, areas. Since the beginning of the Stockholm Convention, that was uh, 2004, with preparation, uh, the International Pollutant uh, Elimination Network, IPEN, has monitored X around priority dioxin and PCB sources listed in the Stockholm Convention, including metal industries, shredder plants, e-waste recycling, waste incinerators, dump sites, open burning sites. Over the last 15 years, they have done much publications, many publications, and we have written in 2000, uh, in last year, 2022, a review article on that. So when you look to chicken and egg, you have different exposure pathways. Yeah? One is the soil, but of course, also you can have it, for example, in the feed. This is not working. Uh, in the feed or in the bedding, and also on the side of farms, you have uh, specific uh, point sources 
like uh, PCB paints from the history or sealants, which have been used also in stables. But soil is the major exposure pathway for free-range uh, poultry, since a free-range chicken eat a day between 11 gram to 30 gram of soil. And we have a transfer factor for the most uh, toxic ones, which is about 50% of that PCBs and dioxins on the soil is transferred to the egg and to the meat, finally. So in 2022, we have published this uh, review article. And here we have included data on contaminated eggs from these 20 years of monitoring from IPEN. So IPEN has monitored about 113 different chicken flocks around contaminated sites. And what is impressive is that 88% of these eggs are above the EU limit. So this means close to 90% of the sites uh, they checked um, were uh, above regulatory limit of the EU. And if you reach that limit of the EU at the same time, uh, one egg a day uh, exceeds for children the FAO, WHO tolerable daily intake. Yeah, so quite relevant, also exposure relevant. I start with the metal industry because that really stro stroke me. So IPEN has sampled 21 pooled chicken eggs around steel industries in seven countries, Armenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Egypt, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Thailand, Ukraine, and all eggs were above the regulatory limit, all 21 sites. And the mean value here for the toxicity in the eggs were 26 picogram, which is five to 10 times above regulatory limit in the EU. This means one egg is enough for a child for 10 days, 20 days tolerable uh, daily intake. So this indicates that all areas around these metal industries were unfit for free-range chicken farming. At 15 of these 21 sites, the commercial PCB pattern in the eggs were the main TEQ, the dioxin-like TEQ contributor. Yeah? So normally when you think about the metal industry, you think also more about dioxins in the emissions. Yeah? But what we see here is that over the past 40 years, PCB have entered metal smelters on metal scrap and have emitted these PCBs into the environment. Yeah? You do not see it, yeah? but much of these PCBs are with capacitors, with transformers, yeah? or painted uh, uh, metals, and they go into the, 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 the smelters and are then uh, emitted. This highlights that the management of metals from PCB containing transformers, capacitors, and other PCB co contaminated metals need a better control and a better cleaning of metal parts before they enter copper or alumina smelters. Then uh, IPEN has also uh, sampled shredder facilities. They have found high, and we know also from Germany that we have high releases from shredder plants still today because of capacitors in washing machines and other electronics, but also cars, uh, even cars pr produced between 1970 to 80 contain PCB brake fluids. So here the global monitoring studies showed for six chicken flocks around shredder plants uh, in three countries, Belarus, Mexico, Czech Republic, that all were above regulatory limits. Yeah? Here for Belarus near a, a shredder plant for cars, uh, close to Minsk, they had 15.6 uh, picogram, this means five times ab above uh, regulatory limit, and 73% contribution of the toxicity came from PCBs, only 27 from dioxins. The same uh, in Mexico, lower contaminated, um, seven pic picogram TEQ, 36% came from PCB. And in the Czech Republic, they uh, analyzed in one a smaller city where they have a recycler uh, and shredder of, of, for, for PVC uh, that also all eggs were above the regulatory limit and 52 to 79 percent of the TEQ came from, from PCB. The highest contaminated eggs they found at e-waste recycling sites. Yeah, so here they monitored seven pooled eggs in five countries, Ghana, Kenya, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. 
and uh, the TEQ were between 20 to 850 picogram TEQ with a mean TEQ value of more than 300 picogram. Yeah, this mean 100 times above the the, the TEQ uh, of the European Union. And uh, there they found also the highest contaminated egg. Um, this was in for, for PCBs that was in Kenya. At a, it, there was not open burning. So in Kenya, that was rather a market yeah, where they dismantled this equipment and sold this equipment. And so you see that uh, at that site, 98%, uh, 97% of the TEQ in the eggs uh, came from, from PCBs. Yeah. Uh, what you see here, this is the open burning, that's uh, Ghana, Akboboshi. At this site, the highest total contaminated egg was found ever with 355 picogram TEQ and about 200 picogram TEQ came from PCB. The reason here is when you have open burning, the PCBs are also converted then to the furans. So therefore, uh, you get a much higher uh, furan and dioxin contamination of these eggs. But this highlights that e-waste sites in developing countries can be PCB uh, hotspots, also from the mismanagement of PCB containing equipment. Then I already mentioned uh, these kind of um, point sources on the farms. So um, in the IPEN study, they sampled eggs uh, in Kazakhstan at a very remote farm. So actually, they thought that this is the background. So they wanted to have background eggs. <laughs> and then in these background eggs, they found 150 picogram PCB. Yeah, the, the, this is the fifth highest P dioxin PCB egg. Yeah, in a very pristine area. So the reason is you have PCB paints and these PCB paints were often used also on farms. Yeah, and these paints are super in performance. So even after 50 years, they, they still stick. Um, similarly, it has been found in the Netherlands. So in, in that time, Hogenboom, he did then a detailed assessment on the farm and he found, yes, it's the PCB paint on the asbestos roof. And in, also in Germany, we found on different farms, PCB contamination and the source was PCB paint on the asbestos roof. And over the decades, the PCB run down with the water and with the dust and contaminate uh, the farms. So this highlights that PCB paints can be relevant PCB sources on farms and that within a national PCB inventory, because normally the Stockholm Convention are only looking to transformers and capacitors. Yeah, but 25% of all PCB we have used in open application like, like paints and sealants. Yeah, and of course, they have a much higher release potential compared to the transformers when they are closed. Yeah, so yes, we see that they are also relevant. Then, uh, one slide, contamination of feed and one lesson learned from 2000 in Europe. So here, uh, in 1999, it was found that thousands of farms in Belgium were contaminated with PCB because 25 to 50 liter of PCBs were not managed appropriately, were collected by a, a company which at the same time managed food fed. And then they put the PCB directly in 107 tons of animal feed. So by this chicken eggs, meat, pork, beef were found in Belgium, hundreds times of today's EU food limits. In total, 500, 450 chicken farms, 750 pig farms, nearly 400 cattle farms were impacted with millions of eggs and 10,000s of tons of meat, which had to be destroyed at that time. So the 25 liter of PCB cost more than 1 billion direct cost yeah, for the Belgium economy at that time. So therefore, material cycle management in the EU, it is uh, meanwhile prohibited that industries which deal with waste oils, they are not allowed to deal with waste food fats. So this is in Europe is separated, but in developing countries probably still uh, the case. Last source, landfills and dump sites. So here, IPEN monitored um, 20 uh, landfills and dump sites. And uh, overall, when you look to the PCB management in the last 50 years, more than 50% of all PCB have ended in landfills and dump sites. Yeah? So 
And from there, because they are quite persistent and semi-volatile, they can migrate out of the landfills. So here, 16 out of 20 pooled eggs around landfills and dump sites were above EU limit. 12 of these 20 sites had mainly contribution from PCB. Here, one from a landfill in Moldova. You see it's only PCBs, not much with, uh, with dioxins and furans, and up to 50 picogram. Yeah, but also landfills in Belarus, Cameroon, Gabun, Uruguay, yeah, all the chickens around had contamination uh, from PCBs and from dioxins. So therefore, PCB should not be disposed to landfills oh, no. and around landfills. Um, you should you have take care. three minutes left, Roland. Sweet. I, I need only two, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 no, no, we have time for it. So, um, we can ask us, what are the critical soil levels for impacting an egg above regulatory limit? And this is uh, simple mathematics. So, with a total uptake uh, for PCB and dioxins of 50 picogram, uh, you come above the regulatory limit of 5 picogram. Yeah? Then, uh, chickens eat per day between 11 and 30 gram. And we need the carryover. This means how much of the PCB which is on the soil, when a chicken eats the soil, goes into the egg. Yeah? And when you take these numbers, you come to approximately 3 to 7 nanogram TEQ per kilogram for the sum of dioxins and PCBs. And this is very, very low. Yeah? So in Germany, for example, we have a regulatory limits for, for dioxins in, in uh, uh, so, uh, soils um, of 1,000, or in the Netherlands, of 1,000 nanogram. Yeah? So a, a, a chicken egg there would have several hundred times above the regulatory limit. Yeah? In Germany, for um, playgrounds, we have 100 nanogram. Yeah? So at the moment, there is no regulation, actually, which uh, meet which would request these kind of uh, uh, limits in the soil. Yeah? But it is a very relevant exposure pathway, especially for those people which have owned chickens. Yeah? So these problematic soil levels are extremely low and are exceeded in many areas of industrial emissions and can also be exceeded in cities or residential areas. Um, and therefore, it needs to be assessed in respect to exposure. Conclusions? The large PCB and dioxin contamination along the life cycle of PCB, including production, use, and especially here the end-of-life treatment, demonstrate that an overall assessment of PCB-contaminated sites along the life cycle of PCB is needed. The large pollution detected at metal smelters, e-waste recycling sites, shredder plants, around landfill dump sites, highlight that an overall improvement of PCB management in end-of-life is urgently needed in developing and emerging economies and that care need to be uh, now when we have an increased management because PCBs need to be managed by, uh, phased out by 2025 and finally be managed 2028 according to the Stockholm Convention. So therefore, over the next years, we, have, we will have much more pressure yeah? and we need to take care uh, when we have to run that we do not further pollute. In addition, human exposure from related PCB contaminated sites and soil from the past and ongoing PCB releases need to be assessed. Contamination of food products like not only eggs, but also milk and meat need to be assessed, controlled and eliminated, and we have uh, written their review articles. Please note that the WHO is at the moment looking to the toxic equivalency factors of PCB, so this might change in future. Yeah? And it depends from this TEF factors, what is the total uh, toxicity of the PCBs. In our review, but I will not go through them, we have made policy recommendations together with IPEN, including recommendation on waste management, recommendation on inventory of emission sources and contaminated sites, recommendation of legislative limits, and also addressing farmers and consumer needs. And I recommend you to have a look. It has open access. The paper is quite interesting. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you. No, it's okay. It's just ah. thank you very much. Excellent work, really. Uh, we uh, had many, you know, works in the past about the uh, actual thickness 
uh, of the bald eagle, you know, uh, about exposing, exposing to, it was more about DDT and uh, the DDE, and also about, I think about PCBs. Mm -hmm. uh, did you manage, did you just study the, any effect of the thickness of the ah. shell? And any relation to those walls? Yes, no. Uh, I mean, they have not measured the eggshells. Yeah. But I know, of course, the DDT. That's very important. Of course, no, no. In, for the high that levels. That's the reason of destruction of the bald eagle and that thing. Yeah, yeah, yes. So I know that there are studies also today. So that was, let's say, a, a big problem in the 70s for the yeah. eagles and so on. So that was a, a reason for uh, yeah. bringing them to extinction, nearly. Um, and there is still, I know, uh, eggshell thinning in South Africa, for example, where you have a high use of DDT. So the levels of PCBs, I think, in these eggs are not at that levels that you really have an eggshell uh, thinning. Yeah, I mean, at least when you look to the DDT levels, they are, let's say, an order of magnitude or more also higher. I mean, you know from Netherlands that you have difficulties, right, to, to manage these small, small capacitors, yeah. Um, I think in the, you, you have a definition in the Stockholm Convention on, on the total size, five yeah, deciliter. the five deciliter, and I think for the small capacitors, they would be below the five deciliters, yeah, or? Definitely. Huh? Yeah. So, um, and you know, I mean, to find these millions and millions of uh, small capacitors is a hassle. So therefore, at the moment, unfortunately, the open applications is not uh, really very much uh, addressed in the Stockholm Convention, but I think it's yeah. relevant. Yeah, yeah, that was my idea as well. And I know in the Netherlands we we collect a lot of those small capacitors because all the small capacitors from uh, the we we waste mm -hmm. uh, have to be treated as PCB suspected. Yeah, and, and they, we get a lot of them actually. Yeah, yeah. But you, I think you see with Africa, you know, with the e waste sites, yeah, yeah, how important it is. Yeah, and I think there should also be, let's say, um, activity in this respect. The waste sites. So basically, that, that would suggest that we need to, to take care of the, the smelting and uh, shredding practices yeah. to reduce emissions in general. Yeah, what you see with the shredders. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much. Good morning. My, na <clears throat> my name is Edgar Bürger, and I'm working with the sodium technology. Sodium is my matter. Sodium is my subject since more than 30 years. We are located right in the middle of Germany, very close to Frankfurt mine. Our interest basically is the product development on base of alkali metal, especially sodium, sometimes potassium. And we try to transfer our knowledge to companies, institutions who are working with the sodium metal. Especially in the environmental part, we are working with the high reactivity of sodium and uh, also <clears throat> develop procedures for application of sodium in very different uh, areas of chemical industry. So we set up several plants for decontamination of oil because you can use the high reactivity of sodium only if the material that has to be treated is in liquid phase, liquid phase without water. And we made some optimization consultations for sodium producing plants in India, in Mumbai, and in China, in the Northeast. The tricky thing is how to use the sodium in a safe way in handling. On the right-hand side, you see <clears throat> a flow of looking like, it's looking like a gray milk. That's a sodium dispersion, meaning very fine divided sodium with a particle size, let's say about 10 microns in mineral oil. That's the material you have to use and apply if you try to make smooth reactions with full efficiency, nearly 100% of conversion. The basic chemical principle is terribly simple. <clears throat> 
You have the PCB molecule, which consists of one or up to 10 chlorine atoms. You let it react with the sodium and the final products is a mixture of carbohydrates, carbon hydrogen polymers and sodium chloride. You can replace the PCB molecule, certainly also by any other halogen organic compound, such as HCH, for example, the main topic in this Congress. The basic advantages of the sodium technology is the rather low investment cost for the plant, for the unit you need. It's not very complicated. The inexpensive reagents, it's wrong, it's only one reagent, it's the sodium metal. It's a common chemical product which is produced in a scale of some 100,000 tons worldwide. We sometimes talk about the fear of the preparation of dioxins and furanes. You can forget this discussion because we are working at a temperature where there is no risk of formation of dioxins and furanes. You can prepare the treatment unit in a stationary way or as a mobile unit if you wish. And our intention is to recover most of the treated oil as fuel, as lubricant, or as base oil also for transformer oil itself. The technical part is quite simple. In the red field, you see the, what we call the halogenated contaminated oil, maybe PCB or any other kind of contaminant diluted in organic solvent. You prepare the sodium dispersion by mixing sodium metal with the oil, divided into very fine particles, as I said, in the area of 10 microns. Make the decontamination step, and you're left with the sodium chloride and organic polymer, polymer mixture, and recover the decontaminated oil and make it ready for use. That's one example, a unit which was set up for a Korean company. Their intention was to transfer, to, trans, uh, to treat transformer oil <clears throat> at a quantity of 1,000 liters per hour. On the left-hand side, it's the part where the sodium dispersion basically is produced. And on the right-hand side, it's a kind of pipe reactor keeping the transformer oil that has to be treated at appropriate temperature. And this unit was uh, set in operation, I think it was in uh, 2009. Yes. When we go back some years, you see some examples from the local landfill Hamburg, Georgswerder. Yesterday, you got a lecture here about all the chlorinated compounds which were produced in a company very close by. And we made the initial test runs for the treatment of the effluents from the local landfill. The project was then carried on by a German company, Umweltschutz Nord, who concluded, concluded all the work on the local landfill two years later. You can see from this short table that on the right hand side, the detection limits of the several classes of chlorines, chlorine compounds, can be reached in any case. So the sodium metal does not take care of the kind of the organic chlorine, it reacts with any kind of chlorine to the final state of detection limit. In Tokyo, there's a plant running with a very special form of sodium. Because in Japan, the limits are completely different from the rest of the world. In Japan, they talk about contamination PCB in oil when you think about 5 or 10 ppm. The Japanese limit is 0 0.5 ppm of PCB, which is allowed in transformer oil. And you can reach this very low limit applying sodium on inorganic supporter 
and let it run the cascade system either once or if you like also you can circulate at elevated temperature meaning 60 centigrade and you're left with your transformer oil which can be prepared ready for use in medellin colombia the company epm empresas publica medellin set up a mobile unit which is basically now used as a stationary unit we set up the unit uh, for the, on the right hand side, <clears throat> preparation of the sodium dispersion. And also, again, a pipe reactor was applied. And this small unit is uh, working with 250 liters per hour. And the expected limits of less than two ppm are reached at any time. I just got to the uh, most recent figures from Mauricio, who is the leader of the uh, team in Medellin at EPM. And he told that uh, more than 1,200 equipments already have been treated successfully, and more than 175,000 liters run through the unit and are still running today. So, can be done in a very small unit, it can be done in larger units. For example, in Johannesburg, we set up a dispersing unit, which is constructed from a preparation tank of three cubic meters, 3,000 liters, and storage tanks of 5,000 liters. You can add the sodium metal by hand, with protect personal protection certainly is required. And the application there was completely different, but the chemistry is almost the same. They use the sodium dispersion for desulfuration of oil. So the sodium, again, can be used with its high reactivity for the cleavage of the carbon sulfur bonds as well. So I make it short. Conclusion and challenge for the future. From my point of view, as you're aware, I'm one of the older people in this room. The younger people shall start to continue applying the sodium technology. And they should use it for the improvement of the environment, not for us ourselves, but also for our children and their children. A few months ago, our German Chancellor Olaf Scholz made a political word, <clears throat> Zeitenwende, which can be translated by the song from the Scorpions, Wind of Change. For politicians and also for scientists, which are among us, that should mean, what did we do in the past? We heard, waited, and further investigate. In the future, we should change and listen, listen to the people decide and act and do not wait. Thanks for your attention and peace for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. From the chemistry point of view, the reaction is quite clear. But, but as an owner of uh, electrical equipment contaminated with PCB, we wanted to know what is the price for the technology which is already applied in, in practice, in life, this is one, how long it will, it will take, and of course, the, um, I, go, I, 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 we, I suppose that the cost at the end will depend on the content of chlorine in each Basically. component, because you need to add extra mm, sodium <clears throat> depending on chlorine in the compounds. And why it is not you know uh, scaled up and you know promoted at the international level because everyone right now is looking for easiest one incineration when i took right the cost for the treatment when you think about the sodium as a commercial product uh, if you take for a rough calculation the price of 10 euros per kilogram since every chlorine needs one sodium certainly it depends as you said already depends on the chlorine content 
Well, let's uh, roughly think about, let's say, 1% 1, 1 of chlorine, which is rather high in transformer oil. 1% of chlorine, meaning 2% 2, 2 of PCB. You will end up with cost about uh, 50 up to 80 euros per ton of oil. Just for the chemical, uh, for the chemical path. Which is still quite expensive, I would say. Sorry? Which is still quite expensive. But that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, think, I think 18 euros, you said, one eight? It's 10 euros per kilogram of sodium metal. Yeah, and then how much for a ton of oil? If you have 1%, 1 of chlorine, meaning 10%, uh, 10 kilograms oh, okay. per ton, yeah. roughly saying it's 10 kilograms of sodium, which is in excess. 10 by 10 means 100 euros for the sodium per ton of oil with 1% of chlorine. Uh -huh. It's just as a rough calculation. Thank you very much. Then you keep the oil. That's nice. Eh? <laughs> you can recover the oil for more than 95%. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Frank Wouters. I'm from Belgium. Yeah, my accent probably. So uh, I already understood. I will stop eating eggs in the morning. <laughs> so uh, two years ago, I was asked uh, if I, want, if I uh, wanted to manage a company, uh, which is a PCB decontamination. And my first reaction was, this is palliative care. Yeah, I thought already all, all the PCBs, they were gone, they were out. Uh, what I've learned today, it's the complete uh, opposite. Uh, so the amount, the total amount of PCBs uh, still in the world is estimated between 1 million and 1.5 and million tons of PCB oil. Yeah. This is amazing, amazing quantity. Um, the treatment today of PCB capacitors and transformers is in the range of 10, 15 and 25,000 tons per year. Yeah. Each capacitor or transformer, it contains about 25% of uh, PCB oil. Mm -hmm. So we have the total amount of PCB oil and the treatment. At least we can say we are not in balance. Okay. The treatment of the PCB oil is one point. You can drain out PCB oil uh, because we have to face the, the Stockholm Convention 2025, 2028. <laughs> The treatment of the oil, I think we can manage because this is incineration or other techniques like uh, dechlorination techniques. This, this we have, this is existing. The other part is the solid part. When the transformer is drained or the capacitor is drained, we need to clean the metals. And this takes much more time. And it's a, a huge, huge quantity which is left. So this is the activity of our company, which is PCB decontamination. So we are not PCB destruction company, but it's a PCB decontamination plant for cleaning the metals. Okay. So these are our figures for uh, today. So the company started in 1995. We are located in Grimbergen, which is near Brussels. And our shareholders, it's 51% uh, of Veolia. Uh, I take part of 100% uh, Veolia. 26% um, is Indaver. Indaver is the largest incinerator company in Belgium. You know, uh, using uh, rotary kiln to destroy the PCB. So all the residues we produce, they are sent to Indaver for final destruction. And we have 23% of Renew. Renew is a waste collector in, in, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. Mm -hmm. You see my salary, uh, total input is uh, 3,300 tons, which we have treated last year. Uh, in 2021, uh, last year we treated 3,100 tons, so it's always in the same range. We recycled metals, this is our business, recycling of metals, and uh, mainly we are selling the metals, uh, the clean metals, the copper, the, the, the iron, and so on. So we recycled 2,680 tons in 2021. We are working with 12 people, and we contribute to a CO2 reduction of 7,400 tons. CO2 reduction becomes very important for uh, uh, waste treatment companies, so we are expressing every figure. We are always expressing the CO2 uh, saving. 
within within our figures. We have, uh, uh, of course, fully certified ISO certification of, of uh, yeah. So these are the countries on which we are working. We are working worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, what is uh, a bit uh, surprising, so uh, uh, we are still receiving a lot of material from Europe. Mm -hmm. More than 75% of our input is still coming from Europe. Mainly transformers with lower uh, PCB decontamination grade, but we are still there. Mm -hmm. We are delivering the full service. So uh, when we are uh, looking for a far away country, uh, we are looking for a local partner, uh, we deliver in service, we uh, give trainings, we assist and so on. Uh, we organize the transport, we organize everything which is Basel Convention uh, and so on. So we, in fact, we do this full, full service from the collection to, uh, to the treatment. Mm -hmm. This is our uh, main installation. So we are using the autoclave technique to, for cleaning the metals. Mm -hmm. um, it's a closed, a fully closed system. We are using a solvent, it's a chlor chlorinated solvent. Uh, we are using and in the machine, we put in the, the dirty materials. And then we have a spray of uh, cold solvent. We have a vapor injection. We use uh, temperature, we use uh, vacuum uh, to clean the metals. At the end, because we are working with solvents, we create a new problem, which is solvent emission. So uh, we, have, uh, we have to make a, a, a vacuum drying at the end before opening the vessel. So this system is working very well. Uh, in fact, what you see, it's only 10% of the installation. Mm -hmm. So behind the installation, you have a heating cooling unit. You have a distill distillation equipment to recycle the solvent. You have a, a huge uh, activated carbon filter, re regenerated activated carbon filter to control the emissions. I just would like to say that this is not not an easy installation just to make it mobile and to put it somewhere in another country. Yeah, so it's a, it's quite a complex installation. Mm -hmm. okay. This system works fine. It's a surface cleaning. This means all uh, everything is cleaned, uh, but the surface need to be accessible. This means the transformer, the core of the transformer, you have to dismantle it because it's packed material and you have to open the material and then put it in the machine and then you are sure that it's, that it's fully cleaned. Okay. This system is a cleaning system for metals. It doesn't like everything which is porous and the porous material in a transformer is giving uh, several problems, mm -hmm. uh, mainly for the drying. So for this system, when, when there is a lot of paper inside, a lot of uh, wood inside, we need uh, much longer drying times than a standard metal decreasing machine. I come back to the porous material because this is uh, a real problem. Mm -hmm. This is the incinerator from uh, Indaver. So all the residues uh, PCB containing we send to the, to the incinerator company. I think the, the, the most important is the incineration, tem incinerator temp uh, incineration temperature of uh, 1100 degrees and a duration of 20, between 25 and 35 minutes at that temperature to ensure all the PCBs are destroyed. Okay. Would like to come back to the, the, the porous metals. So what we have done, so we, we are receiving uh, PCB transformers. We are checking the oil, measuring the PCB content. And at the left column, you see, uh, you see the PCB concentration in the oil. Mm -hmm. We take out the core, we clean the metals and so on in, in our machine. What we see, the, the metal, the residual PCB content on the metals was fine, was below than one PPM. Mm -hmm. When we take samples of the wood, or the paper, we are not reaching the 50 ppm, even with our system, even with the solvent, even with the temperature, even with the high pressure, with the vacuum, and so on. We are not reaching the 50 ppm uh, threshold value for PCP uh, contamination. This is very important because uh, a lot of countries, they want to treat it locally. And when a transformer is containing, let's say, 500 ppm of uh, PCB, they do a retrofilling. filling They take out the oil, they fill it with new, uh, fresh oil, or they do the sodium treatment, like uh, we have heard before. And they 
Uh, and then as a rule of thumb, you can say the concentration will decrease by factor 10 on PCB level. So the 500 ppm will go to 50 ppm. Uh, and then the transformer is what we call green. Mm -hmm. We have to take some, yeah, uh, some reserve on this because when this transformer, this is a green transformer, uh, when it comes to end of life of this transformer, the, the guy who will dismantle the transformers, take out the value of metals out of it, the copper, the aluminium, the iron, uh, he will create some fractions like the paper and the wood. And this fraction is still a tox toxic fraction. I can tell you it's very nice wood. When you do it in foreign countries, they will use the wood to make fire and they, 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 they will use it to, to warm the houses and so on. And then you will have the risk and we will have the story of the eggs again, uh, maybe 10 years later. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. So I'm always asking uh, when you do a retrofilling of a transformer, put on a label uh, so that we can see the history of what's happened with the transformer, okay? To be sure that that is gone. This means that every transformer, which had a higher concentration of PCB, uh, they should be destroyed at the end by a professional. Because he has to, he has to take the the, the, the polluted materi materials like wood and paper, and bring it to an industrial incinerator. What we often present to uh, to the UNEP or UNON uh, offices is that uh, we, we are making a decision tree because we also uh, a very important cost today is the logistic to bring the transformer to, to Belgium. And uh, therefore, we have made uh, something like a decision tree uh, where we, make, where we uh, make a split into a PCB value, the transformer uh, rating, uh, the age of the transformer. And at the end, we can test if the transformer is still in good condition. Today, you have the electronic equipment who can measure if the transformer is still in good equipment. We can perform oil analysis to see if we can reuse the transformer afterwards. Okay. But every time when a retrofilling was done, we should take care of the poorest parts at the end. We are facing some problems today. I think uh, that Kian already mentioned. Uh, so, so today, more and more shipping lines they are not willing to transport uh, pop, yeah, because it's a severe marine polluant, and there is a severe control on these products. So when a ship is blocked for one day, it, it will have a cost of three hundred thousand euro, for example. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Basel notification. It's a fantastic system. Uh, the only way some countries they are they are asking us things. Uh, far beyond their responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so then, uh, for example, we had some transit countries who were asking us, give us the consent of all the other countries, and then we, give, we will give you the consent. Okay, that's fine when you have only one country like that, but if you have two countries like that, you have a, you, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, for some uh, uh, Basel notifications, we need four to six months to survive, and it's really it's uh, it's 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 nearly a, a full FDA who is working on this, uh, replying on all the comments and so on. Um, to avoid the transit countries, we did some shipping by uh, plane, air transport, but it's extremely expensive. It's between five and ten thousand kilo euro per ton of material, so it's. It's, in fact, it's no solution. Mm -hmm. um, and what we are missing in the Basel notification is something like an ombudsman. Yeah. So we would like to go to somewhere. We have a problem with that, and and someone is uh, interfering or something. So to to help us, we are missing this guy. So every country Basel notification is, yeah, it's they all give their own interpretation today. Mm -hmm. so three minutes left, right? Okay, yeah. I, yeah, this was the end, end of my presentation. If you have further questions, we have a stand below. So uh, I'm pleased to yeah, give more explanation on the cleaning system or on the Basel notification and so on. Okay. And if there are any questions, you can reach me. Thank you. <laughs>
So ba basically for this, this basal notification, I also heard uh, the people from uh, Polyeco telling uh, similar stories about these uh, obstacles they uh, experience uh, for uh, export for Macedonia, for example. Uh, so the, the idea is maybe to, to uh, prepare as, uh, as an industry for these field services, a kind of uh, guidebook how to make a successful and viable uh, basal notification. And then we can also uh, see where uh, we can uh, com com communicate this with the basal committee. Because another example is you never know if, you, if they take six months to give you the uh, no notification, the routes, the shipping routes will have changed because shipping routes are updated every six months by the, the shipping companies. So once you get uh, the approval, the routes have changed. So what do we do? We put maybe 20 countries in the notification where we will only use six actually. So the, yeah, so the, 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 uh, the approval gets more complicated because we are asking 20 countries instead of six. And if we don't do that, when once we, we have the notification, the approval, uh, it's not valid anymore because we cannot change the route of a notification that has been approved. So there's, there's all these kind of issues that, uh, that we can compile and see uh, how we can uh, at least make sure that we get uh, some notifications that actually help us to transport. Yes, you are completely uh, correct. Actually, I wanted to ask you, uh, what is the... Uh, uh, result of your technology because uh, after applying the solvent you should separate the PCBs from the oil you have cleaned or washed. Yes. Uh, I suppose that you send it for final incineration. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because in the presentation. So we use a, like, we use a solvent for cleaning, like a, a degreasing greasing mm -hmm. solvent, and after use the drum the drum is drained. Mm -hmm. And as we go to a, to a first atmospheric distillation, the atmospheric distiller is also delivering the vapor for the vapor injection into the drum. And this residue of the first distillation is going to a second distillation, which is a vacuum distillation. And at the end, we have a residual 5% of solvent uh, with PCB oil, other oil, and this we send to Endeavor. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you use perchlorethylene as a solvent or, or, or not? Yes. The name of yes. So solvent. we have uh, two common uh, chlorinated solvents. One is methylene chloride, and the, the other one is perchlorethylene. Mm -hmm. The methylene chloride is more aggressive, so probably a better solvent, exactly. but you have more problems on, on emission because of the lower boiling points. And perchlorethylene, you can use the effect of the temperature. You can go up to 120 degree, which is important to to yeah. You have the effect of the temperature here. You're missing with methylene chloride, which is a rather cold mm -hmm. treatment. Thank yeah. you. And back to the challenges you have uh, expressed. Actually, we need to think about uh, mobile units in order to avoid all of this uh, bureaucracy of the papers, especially when you try to, to get a notification. When, again. when you will set up a mobile unit like this, like a mobile degreasing unit, we are thinking about it. We are thinking of, we have some plans, but it's not, it's, it's not always easy. Because if you have a mobile unit, you also have to think of the permitting. Yeah, how would, how, will, how would you deal with the permit, uh, with the customer on site and so on? So this is not so easy. And uh, for there, for sure, I would not use a chlorinated solvents because this is a, a big part of our installation is the air pu purification behind. Yeah, yes. this is really important. So the, the end, you end the solvent which is contaminated. And yeah, you have to, you have to imagine. Export it. again. When you're working with a pure solvent, you have uh, approximately 150,000 uh, grams per cubic meter in the air. Yeah. And you have to go down to 20 milligrams per cubic meter as in, in the exhaust. That's a real challenge. Yeah. So we That's use right. cooling, uh, chilled water. We have membrane filtration in front of, and then we go to activate the carbon. Yeah. Yeah, you need a big installation in a moderate climate also, because mm -hmm. if the, the, the outside temperature is too high, the, the, the vaporization is also a bigger issue. Yeah. 
It's the same with the incineration. Huh? You have a small incinerator and you have a big air treatment behind. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Dick. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you here. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm probably uh, the furthest, maybe my colleagues from Iran, but uh, I'm from South Africa. And I'd like to chat to you about um, pesticides and PCB destruction projects in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, what went wrong and um, what has changed since the 1990s when most of these projects were started. Um, but this is also an, an open question because many of you have been in this game much longer than I have. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, how do we establish local um, pesticide and PCB management capacity in sub-Saharan Africa? So this is more of a session to raise questions for you to help me answer. Um, and I'm going to challenge you perhaps, and then um, I would ask for your replies. So the previous disposal projects that were uh, highly uh, publicized were the project of Danida in Mozambique at the Matola cement factory, which was attempted. That project never went ahead. The biggest reason was that there was so much environmental opposition from a local extremist environmental group in South Africa that the cement company decided it was no longer worth proceeding. And unfortunately, the Danish development agency lost a lot of money there. There were also trials by the German um, aid agency GIZ at the Waza Hill cement plant in Tanzania. There were tests done successfully in Ethiopia with USAID and also the FAO. Unfortunately, one of the common um, traits of all these tests were that the cement companies that they had selected were poorly prepared. By poorly prepared, I mean the environmental control conditions in those cement kilns were not to European standards. Um, yes, the European Cement Directive had not been established yet. This was pre-2000. Uh, but also, the African or Southern African cement industry was not in the environmental position it is now. Common problems, as I said, had to do with the cement kiln preparedness, general performance, um, and environmental performance. But also one of the biggest issues was stakeholder communication and education. Unfortunately, um, African governments or Southern African governments are still plagued by a lack of capacity, especially in the environmental management. Um, and that comes with it a, an NGO community that is almost militant, which means that the, the government officials um, it's really difficult to make a decision um, because you are likely to be crucified by the environmental NGO community. What has happened since 2010? The cement industry in Southern Africa has, un has undergone incredible growth. With the establishment of modern cement plants in almost every southern African country, or almost every sub-Saharan African country. You had the emergence of new multinational cement companies like Dangote, and then the entrance of, or the strong entrance of the European majors, but also Chinese cement companies in, in sub-Saharan Africa. These cement kilns have the most modern technology, um, and also due to the involvement from the International Finance Corporation and European development banks um, and their application of the equator principles. The environmental conditions that the cement kilns and the cement companies have to comply to are just as stringent as in Europe. 
their environmental requirements are no longer associated with the country that they work in. Because they are financed from Europe and they are financed through the IFC, their standards are much higher. The next point is, of course, is that there's increased environmental performance from the companies themselves. Modern environmental transparency means that companies can no longer hide poorly performing operations. We all know how easy it is these days to expose a poorly performing operation of an international company. And it happens. So it's no longer possible, which means that international companies that work in developing countries have to apply the exact same environmental requirements in developing countries that they do in the developed world. And then the last is that the NGO community in sub-Saharan Africa has transformed as well. There's a lot more capacity and there's a lot more, I want to say, technical, um, I don't know what the English word is. Um, it's a lot more practical. There's a lot more technical practicality and an understanding of the technical limitations. Unfortunately, we are still sitting with a community that does not practice the NIMBY approach. You know what NIMBY means, not in my backyard. They practice the NOPE approach, which means not on planet Earth. That means, let me give you a good example. PCBs are bad, but they must not be destroyed on planet Earth. You must do something else with them. So they're against any technology. Unfortunately, those kind of NGOs make our lives in the developing world extremely difficult. As a close, I want to raise a few points and ask you for your opinion. What is the road forward? As I said previously, when I worked for a cement company a while ago, we did an extensive exercise to qualify one of our cement kilns for the destruction of pesticides and also for PCBs. This was done under the guise of the then African Stockpile Project, of which many of you will be aware of. The need was great because the cost of destroying these materials in South Africa, instead of sending them to France, would have been a tenth. So the, the, the question at hand was a tenfold increase in the cost. Yet we did not proceed. The reasons why we did not proceed were threefold. It had nothing to do with capacity because the environmental governance capacity in South Africa is strong. It had everything to do with the fact that it was not financially feasible for us to do the qualification because of the incredibly stringent qualification requirements and lack of support at that stage for that qualification. The second one was the lack of support for our discussions with the radical NGO community. The second, we had to do the test and we had to face the radical environmental NGO community. The African Stockpile Project and the international donor organizations that supported it disappeared. They did not stand behind us because it was not politically appropriate to do so. And I'm talking about practical application here. <coughs> So we did not proceed because it was not worth our while. It's exactly what happened in Mozambique, except for the fact that the Mozambican kiln was not environmentally suitable at that stage. So I'm asking and I'm raising this point. It is very, very important that local capacity in Africa is created. The local capacity is available. 
the most modern cement kilns in the world are in Africa right now. International companies are there and they are willing. There are successful private projects happening right now on pesticide containers, on pesticide laced seeds that are being recycled in cement kilns, but it's all happening on a private basis. Why can we not establish local capacity? That's the question I'm asking, because it's there. How do we do this? And that's how I close my presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Well. I think, I think the point you raise is, uh, is universal, uh, yeah. almost. How much interested are people with a problem in a solution? How much would they like not to be a viable solution and then don't have to do anything about the problem? So that's, that could be one aspect. They don't want to be, they don't want to, there to be a solution because then they have to bring the waste, take care of it. Now they can do nothing. I think it's in, in the developing world because in the developing world, companies are left to fend for themselves. They have very, very little government support. To be honest, in the developing world, we look with envy to the government support that European and American companies receive. So it's a, firstly, it's a question of money. If you cannot afford to get rid of your PCB contaminated transformers, you won't if there's no support. So it's a question of money, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, we are discussing the problem of mercury under Minamata or online because of the, you know, Corona all these past three and a half years. Uh, and that's a big problem also. It's just a cement factory <laughs> in, close to my window in near Tehran. And uh, that's a big problem also, the mercury. Also, you mentioned about the discussion in Africa. Uh, I think you are also aware about the, our SICAM discussion that is going very good under the, you know, your of Cape Town. Mm. It's uh, many people, even yeah. further than Africa, and I'm always involved every week, nearly. Yeah, and that is uh, Professor Andrea Rader, that yeah. is uh, the managing that beautifully. Uh, it is under the Sweden, I think, uh, pesticide or something, uh, yes, management, something uh, yes, financially. And that is very good going and now really uh, lots of you know, communication and information about many related things, including the thing that I will speak today, highly hazardous pesticides, but also lead and Pesticides, chemicals, the products, and many uh, some other things also are discussed. Mm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So, just to make it clear, please do not put mercury into a cement kiln. It is not a good idea. What is that? Please, uh, just it's not a good idea to feed mercury to a cement kiln. Yeah, not a good idea. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Just, I know that is a big problem. That we, uh, on the but in, in general, cement oh. kilns and mercury emissions, it's very well controlled. I think Ed can, Ed can also thank speak you. on that. Stefan. Ekman, thank you very much. And uh, I'm not sure I can give you the whole solution <laughs> to your question. Uh, we're, f we're in Central Asia also facing similar problems. Uh, and what I always try to exp I, I would have two points on that one. First, there is not only a cost to action, but there is also a cost to inaction. So the NOPE approach uh, has also a price. Besides, it's not realistic because uh, we are limited to the earth. Uh, a possibility would be to try to establish a national dialogue, which brings together all the stakeholders. I mean, government, industry, NOPEs, less radical NGOs, and it 
to try a common understanding of what is the challenge, what are the different options, and what option would be the most adequate for the South African context. Uh, obviously, as always in life, there's a question of timing and personalities involved, but uh, maybe that might be a vessel which could, if you have regular meetings over a period of two years, you could make a step forward in the understanding that nope is not the answer to your problem. Um, you're right. And that national dialogue in, in South Africa went very well. Um, but it still did not, it, it happened about 10 years ago. And that still did not uh, result in any cement kilns being interested in it. Uh, at that stage, the main reason was cost again. Um, but I think it's time for that to happen. I think something that is also important is if you look at it in the Southern African context or the, the Sub-Saharan context, is that countries do not work well together um, like is happening in Europe. We are all living in our own little island. Um, yes, there's the African Union and all that stuff, but they don't really work well together. And um, it's important, I think, to establish local capacity in, in every single country or in every region. And I think that should perhaps be an effort that, um, that we should work on as an international community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, yeah, still good morning. My name is uh, Ed Verhammer. I'm going to continue a little bit on the talk of, uh, of um, uh, Ekman, he before, uh, uh, but I will also uh, explain a little bit uh, about, um, about the co-processing itself. Um, and I'm also having two slides, which are... Oh, okay. Sorry. And I, st I also have uh, two slides, which are actually the key of my performance, and those are the prerequisites we need to have co-processing in a cement kiln, and some of the issues which were discussed with uh, uh, earlier today will also come back uh, to that. So it's uh, co-processing about uh, in, in cement kilns. The, the, the content is uh, basically uh, uh, what is it, what is about uh, uh, introducing alternate resource partners, which I will skip, then the manufacturing of cement, which I will do very uh, shortly, what is co-processing in a cement kiln, uh, co-processing of pops in cement kilns, and what is the uh, advantage and uh, testing results of, uh, of these in some countries. And then we will also do the international part, and then what are the, um, uh, um, sorry, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the observations and, and, and conclusions uh, I have and also take some take home messages I have. And they will cover some of the uh, questions which were raised this morning, but they will not give all the answers because I also don't have all the answers for that. Basically, um, uh, what is ARP? As I said, I will skip it. It's a small uh, independent company uh, with a lot of uh, experience in co-processing and, uh, and uh, working. We are also not only talking, but we are also actually uh, acting in the field on, an, on a lot of uh, uh, issues which are here. And one of them is, is the POPs, of course. But we also, for instance, did a very simple uh, oil filter machine where uh, oil filters typically go to the, to the landfill. Uh, and this, this simple machine was developed to cut the oil filter, separate the oil, separate the, the paper and separate the steel. And so now instead of going 100% landfill, you go 100% recycling. This is the... Um, uh, manufacturing of cement, basically. I'm going to only talk about the pyro uh, part, the, the heating process, which is actually the middle part. That's where I'm going to be. Uh, we have the quarry, of course, and we have the ready-made uh, ready uh, product. Basically, if you go to a cement kiln, you basically feed the material. Uh, sorry. You, uh, 
Is there a pointer? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, now because on the screen, yeah. Uh, so in the top, you see the, you, you get the raw material in there and on the, on the left hand side, you take the fuels and you have the fuels at, the, at, um, at the, this part. That's where the fuels are put in. Basically, uh, and this is the whole filtering uh, sin. This is the coal mill and the um, and all the other parts. And these are the temperatures which are there. And you can see that those temperatures are quite uh, quite okay for for uh, co-processing uh, or, or, or disposal. I, I call it disposal of pops and PCBs by co-processing. Uh, basically. What we are, what is co-processing actually? Co-processing is using uh, alternative materials while producing a product. And the cement industry is one of them, but it's not only the cement industry, there are also the steel industry, uh, lime industry, uh, um, uh, power generation are also doing the same thing. And basically, um, this, is, uh, this is again where the materials are being fed, some of the, uh, uh, in the kiln main burner, we will typically have uh, non-hazardous uh, liquid AFR and fine solids. And then the other part, which is actually here, we will feed uh, some of the uh, non-hazardous uh, AFR and some of the, uh, the um, uh, non-hazardous fuels, the solids. So that is basically, uh, and then of course, what, uh, and, and what is very important on the cement part is actually what are all the components which cement is made of, which shows you also that there is a lot of uh, lime in that kiln, which is also a good, a good uh, um, media to, uh, to clean uh, the emissions. Basically, um, if you look at the waste hierarchy, uh, we are, the cement co-processing is somewhere in the middle. It's, um, it's using the energy of uh, what is in the waste and it's using the raw material compound which is in the waste, which then typically gives you 100% energy content. So any giga, gigajoule put into the kiln is actually used to produce uh, the cement. We have a high and stable temperature and the temperature is up to 2000 degrees on the gas temperature and uh, 1400 degrees on the material temperature. It's a self-cleaning process because of the calcium oxide and uh, it has a long residence time. The gas for about 10 seconds and the solids for about 30 minutes. There is no ash, all material are retained in the clinker so there is no landfill uh, for it. And we are actually saving uh, CO2 by not having a separate uh, waste incinerator to, uh, to incinerate uh, the waste and using the energy content to replace coal or gas, the, the, the traditional fuel. And then of course there is a continuous monitoring system and this is, very, uh, this is actually a very, uh, very important part of it and I will come back to that in, in the other two pages as well. So basically um, these are the uh, benefits of the uh, cement kiln. Basically if you look at the, if you look at the uh, uh, waste incinerator it's using, uh, it's using the waste it will uh, have about 40% going to landfill and then the greenhouse gases are produced. If you do the same thing, you have the fossil fuels, you have the greenhouse gas from the cement industry, which is much bigger than, uh, than from, from a waste incinerator, not only because of the emissions of the fuel, but also from the product, which is, uh, CA, uh, which is CA, CO2, which will have to, CA, and then we will need the CO2 to, to drive off from the, from the calcium to get the lime. And we have no landfill, as I said. We, we all, all the material will go into the clinker. That's also why we have a very high quality control and quality assurance at the start of the, uh, of, of, by accepting the materials. And if you then 
do the same thing here. You see that the, the greenhouse gases are still the same. So basically the ones, the ones uh, from the incinerator are prevented, which is, uh, which is I think, uh, a, a good thing uh, for, for the environment. Also, um, if I, I have here two slides, which are from a German, uh, from a German report, where you basically see how the energy uh, efficiency uh, is. And so that is also why, why we think that uh, cement kilns uh, should, should be more used for co-processing or, or capable of co-processing in a more efficient way. And then also the operating cost and the individual cost are also much lower. The operating cost and the capex are also much lower than, say, from a comparable waste to energy uh, plant. Actually, in, in Europe, the, there is a study done by Eco, Ecolise, which says that uh, by using the European cement kilns instead of separate waste to energy plants, there could be 15 billion uh, euro saved on investment. Here are some of the um, materials which can be co-processed. Uh, plastics, especially the ones which cannot be recycled yet because they are uh, dirty, contaminated. For instance, this would be, uh, co-processing would be a very good solution for the empty packaging which, uh, which uh, are um, not uh, clean. But we are also having RDF, which is uh, a refuse derived fuel. And we have also some uh, agricultural uh, wastes, which uh, no longer land burn is, is needed. If we uh, go then to the uh, co-processing of POPs, basically here are the two, here are the two slides which I'm, I'm talking about. Um, Basically, co uh, compliance with the Basel Convention, uh, co-processing as a waste uh, treatment, uh, including uh, the destruction, including the in in a, in a national waste management uh, uh, legislation. Because if it's not included, because in some countries it's forbidden to put waste in a, to, into a cement kiln. So if you cannot put waste into a cement kiln, you cannot uh, you cannot co-process. Then the other thing is we need to have a regular stakeholder dialogue. As, I, as, we, as, we, as we already uh, noticed, this is one of the big issues we have. Uh, when, when, we, when cement kilns in the past were not very known for communicating with their, with their uh, environment, what happened in the cement plant was cement plant issues. And that was it. No need to talk with your community. Over the last 30 years, that has changed uh, uh, due to community, but also to, 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 to be more transparent. And if you don't communicate with your community before you start co-processing, or even POPs co-processing, then forget that, that once you start to communicate and the first message is, oh, by the way, we are not gonna go only do cement, but we will also do POPs, then of course, the NGOs and, and, the, and the community will, will not like that very much. So we need to have a good strategy for that. Also, we have to have an, an improved environmental impact assessment for it uh, before to get the permit. Another thing which we also need is uh, you need uh, uh, an improved uh, 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 an, um, approved location, a good technical infrastructure. You cannot have, you cannot co-process in a cement kiln when the electricity is uh, out of order six times a day. Um, then, of course, we have the um, the you have a good power supply, as I said. And also, uh, we have to have an adequate pollution control device. So we need to make sure that what comes out of the stack is measured in a continuous way and also in a non-continuous way. Uh, and, and new developments are there even on the long-term uh, measuring of the emissions to make sure that what we are saying, that that is also the act actual uh, uh, reality. Then, of course, we have the, um, the, uh, 
the exit gas temperature needs to be controlled to prevent uh, the formation of uh, dioxins and furans uh, uh, in, in a good way. And then, of course, we have to have a, clay, a, 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 a clear, a good uh, main, uh, management structure where, where the people are also um, told uh, when they make mistakes. And there should be a very uh, rigorous uh, following of the, of the instructions because we are in a cement kiln. They are typically not, were in the past not used to handle waste. The basic, if you, if you ask people what is the biggest problem of a cement kiln in the past 50 years ago, and sometimes it's still there, it's dust. So those are the things uh, which are there. Okay, these are the other, uh, other ones, but due to the time I have, uh, uh, there is adequate uh, engineering and safety equipment. There needs to be environmental sound, uh, system, uh, 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 sound management systems. Of course, there are some international developments. Basically, uh, this is for, for, um, for me uh, and, and for a lot of cement operators. The uh, Basel Convention, together with UNEP, have made a guideline on it, which we can follow. And these are the documents which we typically take. Okay, this is, um, this is uh, how we did a trial burn on a PCB uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, the proof was uh, five nines. Uh, so it was, um, was according to the, uh, to the limits. There are some other uh, documents. There is some, some literature these days and some scientific uh, documents on, uh, on the, um, on the, uh, the co-processing of POPs and, and PCBs. Um, there is, uh, this is the typical amount of investment we need, additionally to a cement kiln to do a waste, which is about six million. If you compare that with, with some other investments, it's relatively low, but on the other hand, it's too much to ignore that you need to, make, need to be able to make money with it. Um, I will go to the, to my, I will skip this uh, part. Mo my main observation is the cement kiln offers a, a high uh, advantages uh, system for co-processing because we have the high gas temperatures and the high material temperatures and we have the alternative raw materials uh, supply uh, the necessary uh, material. Then, of course, we also have the uh, cement uh, companies have a, a, a local uh, sustainability, a local sustainable solution for it. And basically, we also have uh, 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 no long transport routes uh, with the materials. Uh, and then we also have no, uh, no, um, yeah, the, the, um, uh, much lower investments, as I, as I said uh, before, and uh, for the infrastructure. Then uh, the take home messages are, uh, there is a, a great uh, and urgent global need for, for the things we, we, we do. The principle and the philosophy and the policy developments are there. Um, and we need not, oh, we, we, the, and the only way forward is, is to document everything we do. Um, yeah, that, that is basically concluding my uh, presentation. And, um, and, but I also want to, there is one last remark which I would like to use as the closing remark. And I know that Stefan has already uh, talked about it a couple of times. One of the things we find out is that if you, if you uh, look to use a cement kiln in a, in a project like in Central Asia, like in, uh, like in uh, Egypt or, or in other countries where I've been working, it is very difficult to motivate the cement kiln if they are not co-processing yet, that to, to invest in the co-processing uh, because the project will not pay for it, for all the investments. And so if there is no infrastructure or, or if the co-processing is not part of the waste management 
um, uh, treatment infrastructure, then it will be very difficult to have a feasible uh, op a feasible uh, co-processing of uh, POPs and PCBs in, in cement kilns. So one of the things we, we, need, to be, we need to see uh, how to do it is that we need to, um, to allow the cement kiln co-processing in the waste management treatment uh, hierarchy um, infrastructure of the, of the country. That has two advantages. The price for the, for, the, for the disposal of the project waste will go down because we can do it on, on the end. And we will increase the level of, um, of, uh, of uh, waste management. Uh, the, waste manage the, the countries will go up in the waste management hierarchy. One example I give you, we, we ju I just was in, in Tajikistan. No, in Kyrgyzstan. Sorry, I was in Kyrgyzstan, and there was a, a big, uh, a big uh, fund was raised to uh, to make a new landfill, um, where uh, that material could also be co-processed. But co-processing is is at this moment not yet allowed in the country. So on one hand, the the government is financing a, a new landfill where we only put it in for the net for the for our new generate for our follow-up generations and we don't uh, use that money to increase the waste management infrastructure in in the country i, I think that is a, a mistake but maybe i'm wrong on that thank you very much for your attention It just may be uh, some addition to your last comment on the Tajik landfill. Uh, I think what's happening there is a reflection that if we have to manage waste, we need a toolbox with several tools. Uh, obviously, as you point out, it will be an intermediate repository for highly contaminated waste till it goes to co-processing. Uh, but at the end of the day, we also need uh, possibly, uh, I mean, a country needs also to have a tool where it can uh, store long term things which are in an uneconomic area to be co processed. But also, it could be then the area where we could do bioremediation, phytoremediation treatment of. So I think. To a certain extent, you're right, it would be more efficient to send it directly from excavation to the kiln and not have this intermediate storage. Okay, you have another view. Yeah, I know. I, now the thing what I, what I didn't tell, and I'm sorry about that, but this was for municipal waste. Oh, okay. We, so, you're, okay, it's another landfill you yeah, refer it's an, to. Yeah, it's another landfill. I'm not talking about the, the landfills from the, from the Central Asia project. I'm okay. talking about a landfill which is uh, near Osh where they need to expand the landfill because the present landfill is is almost full and they got fine they got finance from the european uh, development bank to uh, extend uh, the landfill so while in, in 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 about 50 50 kilometers from osh there is the co-processing so if we would pre-treat the material we would save we would not only save uh, space uh, at the landfill but we would also save co2 from the emissions, and we would have uh, a relatively um, relatively uh, cheap fuel compared to the traditional fuel. So it, it, it I, I consider this a win-win-win situation. It's a win for the cement kiln, it's a win for the community, and it's a win for the environment. So for me, the 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 the, the, the logic is 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 not that difficult, but. Probably I'm looking from a different point than the people who decided to build to extend the landfill. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a very important remark for me because we're actually just trying to start development of a roadmap in Kyrgyzstan on how to deal waste. And I will make sure that we also address the aspect of uh, communal wastes as an additional waste stream. So thank you for that. Okay. Uh, I think also speaking that and that brings me to Egmont. Uh, you know, with the mistrust whether co-processing is possible, I think also uh, discussing with it, I think obviously uh, Cementkin would always start hopefully with the easy ways to co-process, peanut shells or oil waste or something. 
that we, where there's less concerns and they demonstrate their experience and then you ramp up into more difficult wastes. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right uh, on that one because for me, uh, POPs uh, and PCB disposal is, I call it always, the Premier League of co-processing. Stefan, you make, you make a very good point. Um, and one of the, that has been one of the problems is that the cement kilns that were targeted in the past, um, fossil fuels in Africa, which was cheap and landfill space was cheap, there was no pressure. So when they were then um, approached, it was a new topic. Um, and I think there also the situation has changed because fuel prices have gone up radically and um, co-processing has become a very hot topic in, in Africa. So I think the time is right now to reconsider from an international perspective whether local solutions um, in sub-Saharan Africa should be considered to help solve the problem. Then I would like to thank you all very much. I think we have a few conclusions uh, that we need to support uh, local treatment uh, by co-processing, also sodium uh, technology and other local treatment uh, that can be done in simple installations. Uh, for solvent uh, washing and solvent treatment, uh, local installations and mobile plants are not very good ideas one of the conclusions because that's that takes a lot of uh, special infrastructure to do it in a safe way um, and uh, I think uh, third conclusion is that we new, need to do something about basal uh, convention and uh, notification procedures or at least make a handbook for uh, the waste warriors to get the stuff moving uh, where it should go without too much obstacles and uh, the, the last one obviously is the deadline for 2028 that does not seem to be achievable uh, in any form currently not even in western europe let alone uh, in emerging economies so thank you very much i hope to meet you uh, during uh, the other sessions and uh, the lunch and the drinks and thank you for uh, being present in this workshop